Would you pray with me? Father, now as we look at your word, I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak and move, have the freedom in this place. God, I pray that you would soften hard hearts that may be in the room, that you would, you would move, you'd convict, you'd support, you'd encourage. Nobody would hear from me today, that we'd all hear from you. In Jesus' name, amen. In Luke chapter 8, I'll give you the context for where we're, where we're going today. We're going to talk about the resurrection, right? Of course, because it's Easter. So Luke chapter 8, let me give you the context. You don't need to follow along. Let me just read this for you at this point. Luke 8, verse 1. Soon afterward, he, Jesus, he went on throughout cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. There's good news here today. If you've never heard anything else at church... If you've, if you've heard anything else other than good news, then I'm sorry for that because we come to church, you should hear good news. There's good news. Jesus is proclaiming good news of the kingdom of God, and that's what we're going to do today. There's good news. And the 12 were with him, 12 disciples, apostles. If you're familiar at all, you grew up in church, maybe you might know of the 12 disciples. But also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. There were women part of the disciples. Women were hanging around. Anytime you get men off by themselves, it, there's trouble. There's trouble brewing. So it's good to have some women in the mix as well. There were women following Jesus as well, which was very rare. Rabbis did not have women following him. But Jesus is not like anybody else. Jesus is not like any other rabbi. Jesus changes everything, including culture. He has women as part of his followers. And some of the women have been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary, called Magdalene. Now hang on, because there's a lot of Marys in the New Testament. There's a lot of Marys. The gospel writers, anytime they mention Mary, they have to like spend two sentences explaining which Mary it was, because there's so many Marys. In fact, we could probably come up with an Easter song called Mary's Did You Know? Right? We've all heard Mary, did you know, at Christmas, maybe too many times. But uh, this could be an Easter, a new Easter song, Mary's Did You Know. That joke went over better first hour. <laughs> it's getting later in the day. Mary called Magdalene. Why Magdalene? Because she was from Magdala. Right? Magdalene, whom from seven demons, how many demons? Not one, two, three, four, five, or six. Seven demons had gone out. And Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's household, Herod's household manager. So you got insiders, you got outsiders as part of the women. You got royalty and you got poverty of the women. You got, you got a whole mix in the group, but they're women. And Susanna and how many others? Many others who provided for them out of their means. They weren't just following Jesus. They were giving to the mission of Jesus. Women, so grateful for women in the resurrection story. I want to focus on one in particular woman. Her name is Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene, Jesus changed everything in Mary's life. Mary was demon possessed. And I'm thinking through the story if you're demon possessed, you probably don't have a job, you probably don't have family members. They have all cut ties with you. You've burned a lot of bridges if you have seven demons living within you. Everybody around you set up boundaries. Seven demons. She's probably living in poverty. She's probably homeless. Be my guess. I'm just assuming here on this. She had seven demons. We grew up in the Western world. Western world. We don't see a lot of spiritual possession, but it is a part of the, of the world, many parts of the world. This is a reality. Mary had seven demons, but that did not define her. She met Jesus, and Jesus changed her life. Jesus transformed her life. Jesus changed everything about her, and from that point on, she never stops following Jesus. She is around Jesus all the time. Mary Magdalene witnessed most of the events surrounding the crucifixion. She was present at the mock trial of Jesus. She heard Pontius Pilate declare the death sentence. She saw Jesus beaten and humiliated by the crowd. She was one of the women who stood near. The earliest witness to the resurrection of Jesus is Mary Magdalene. Mary is mentioned 12 times in the Gospels. 
It's the most mentioned woman in the Gospels, and she is mentioned more than many of the apostles and the disciples. Listen, you heard Abby, a seventh grader, a few moments ago say, I felt like a freak. That's her words, seventh grade language. I felt like a freak. I wasn't accepted. Nobody loved me. Nobody saw me. Nobody accepted me. I didn't have community. She came to a church. She felt safe. Now she has community. She feels seen. She see. She is seen, she's loved, and she's fully known. Mary, I believe, experienced something similar. My life was pointless. I had no worth. Nobody loved me. Nobody saw me. It was like I was alone. And then I met Jesus, and everything changed when I met Jesus. And when she meets Jesus, she doesn't stop following Jesus. The backdrop is all the men have ran away. And we're going to look at at Mary Magdalene, Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. Matthew 28, 1 through 10. Now, after the Sabbath, what happens on the Sabbath? Nothing. Now, after the Sabbath, after a day of nothing, nobody was working, that's the Saturday, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, and the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. An angel of the Lord descended from the... Now, sitting on the stone, not, as if it wasn't enough to just roll the stone away. As the kids would say, that's a flex, to sit on the stone, right? That's a little extra. But angels making a point here, it wasn't, it wasn't too much work for me to roll the stone away. Now I'm, I'm climbing on top of the stone. I'm sitting, I'm sitting on the stone. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. In the fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who is crucified. He is not here. Let me repeat that. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Other gospel writers, in fact, earlier in Matthew, you see Mary and the other Mary, a lot of Marys. You see them, they're present at the burial. Joseph and Nicodemus do the anointing and the burial of, the body of Jesus, which was very unusual because men didn't do that. That was a, a job saved for servants and slaves. But these men, Joseph and Nicodemus, they end up doing the burial, and the women stood by and watched. Have you ever lost somebody? And you go to the service, you go to the graveside, and you don't want to leave? You linger? You're questioning, is this reality? I don't want to leave. Mary's there at the tomb. She watches this, and she doesn't leave the tomb. She's taking it in. She's grieving. She's weeping. She's processing this. This is the Saturday when Jesus is, is buried. Most of the Christian life as followers of Jesus, if I were to be honest with you, I'll be honest with you today, is lived on the Saturday. We live in light of the reality of what happened on Sunday, but most of life is really the Saturday because we still live in a broken world. Yes, he defeated death, and we live with hope of the resurrection, but life is still hard and difficult and painful. Mary is weeping. Why is she weeping? Because what she had imagined happening to her Savior did not happen. And so she is crushed in her spirit. Has anything ever happened in your life where you thought life was going to go a certain way and it didn't? We could all share stories. I thought this is how my I thought this was going to happen. I thought I had a preferred future, and I thought this was going to happen, and it didn't happen. And you're left crushed, asking God, "What was that all about?" And you're left sitting in your tears. That is where Mary is. She is weeping. She might have wept so much she was dehydrated. You ever been there? You've you've cried so much. You're dehydrated. There are no more tears left. She is, she's tired. She's exhausted. Grief is heavy, and grief will bring exhaustion to all of us. I don't know what you've lost, and I don't know who you've lost in your lifetime. But you cannot get through this world without significant loss and significant grief. I can share stories with you of things that I thought were going to happen in my life. I thought we were going to raise kids. There were going to be all these grandparents around, right? My mom died shortly after we were married, so our girls never knew my mom. And my wife's mom abandoned her when my wife came to give her life to Christ. There was, there was a, a broken relationship there, and so they've never had a grandmother, right? That's just one, it's just one example of 
a story of, boy, things didn't go how I thought they were going to go. It's hard. It's difficult. Grandparents' day. A little awkward with the kids at school, right? There's, I remember following a pastor. Uh, mistake number one, you don't, don't follow people, we follow Jesus. But there was a very significant man in my life who invited me to come be on staff with him. And I loved, I learned so much from this man. He was so wise. He was a great communicator. I was, I loved being on his staff and at his church. And, and a year after I was there, I was like, I could follow this guy the rest of my life. This is great. A year later, he died on a Sunday morning right before he got up to preach. And I'm like, God, what was that about? We moved our whole family across country to follow Brad. And then Brad died. And I'm like, what? What? I got all these questions. And I'm, I'm sitting there trying to process this, what that was all about. And I'm sure you have stories. Of, of grief and sadness and expectations and where you are today is not where you thought you were being. None of us would choose those things to have happen to us, but what is happening is Jesus is, is doing a work in our life through the pain and through the suffering, and Mary is there. That's where Mary is. I'm going to take you to John and show you a more personal encounter that Mary has with Jesus. John chapter 20, if you have your Bibles, you can follow along. John 20, verse 11. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. She was weeping. She was weeping. And she wept. As she wept, she stooped to look down into the tomb. Uh, for those of us who are weeping today, maybe there's something going on in our life. Maybe we lost somebody recently. I want you to know your tears are never wasted as a follower of Jesus. God sees every tear. The Bible tells us in the book of, of Psalms, through David, that every tear is recorded in, the, in, in God's book. There are no wasted tears. Other translations say every tear is kept in a bottle. You have never shed a tear that God did not see and God is not aware of and God does not care about. There are no wasted tears here, my friends. It is okay to cry as a follower of Jesus. It is okay to weep. She wept. And as she's weeping, she looks into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head, one at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Now, have, have you ever tried to have a moment of grief and somebody asks you that question, especially strangers, right? Now, they were angels, so give them a little grace here. Mary's probably like, Well, why are you asking me why I'm grieving? What do you mean, why am I weeping? My Lord and Savior just died. Why are you weeping? What do you mean? He was my whole life. He was my everything. I followed him everywhere he went. He changed me. Anybody ever ask you that question? My parents used to ask me, son, why are you crying? Why are you crying, son? I'll give you something to cry about. <laughs> Hope they're not watching online. My dad's not watching online today. But, uh, you know, that's a, that's a pretty personal question. Why are you weeping? I mean, maybe I'll share with a really good friend why I'm crying. I'll share with my wife. I'm not going to share with strangers. So she, she explained. She said to them, they've taken away my Lord. Now, she's not even thinking about the resurrection. She's like, hey, where? they've taken him. I don't know where they've laid him. Having said this, she turned around. She turned around and saw Jesus standing. Well, she doesn't know it's Jesus. She sees a man. Now, it's dark. It's really, really early. Some of us get up really early for work, 4 a.m. maybe. When is it the darkest at night? It's darkest right before dawn. It was dark. She sees a figure of a man. She doesn't know who it is, though. She can't see his face. She sees a man. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus' hand, but she didn't know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She's like, for crying out loud. I just explained this, why I'm weeping. Why is everybody asking me why I'm crying? Some strange man, right? We were all taught, run away from strange men. Uh, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, would somebody just please help me? I'm just trying to find the body. Somebody, anybody, please tell me. Angels were no help. So now, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him. I will take him away. Mary's the first one to the tomb. I believe she was one of the last ones at the cross, and she's the first one at the tomb. She doesn't stop following Jesus just because he died. She, she shows up at the tomb. She's weeping. Why does she show up at the tomb? To anoint the body of Jesus. She wanted to, to anoint the body. And at that time, this is verse 16, Jesus said to her, Mary. 
Now, she couldn't tell who it was by physical appearance, but she knew his voice. When you hang around somebody for so long, you know their voice, don't you? You know when a friend calls your name. You know when a spouse, you know when a child, you know when a parent calls your name. You know who that is. Mary had been around Jesus so long and knew his voice. The first thing she does, Rabbi! Remember, women didn't have rabbis back then. Rabbi! Teacher! She recognized his voice. And then she grabs him so tight. Back in my youth pastor days, I had to be gone. I would go on to camps and retreats and mission trips. And it was when the girls were little and probably, you know, four or two and barely walking. Um, we had three, three daughters, still have three daughters. They're all adults now. But these three girls, when I would show up to church, I stunk. I was tired. I was cranky. I hadn't slept in 10 days from a mission trip, right? I get out of the 15-passenger van. My wife was... Always, she always had the girls, no matter what time, day or night, that I came back, she had them there meeting us at the church. And I remember one particular time I opened up the 15-passenger van, those three girls come running across the parking lot, Daddy, 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 Daddy's home, Daddy, 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 Daddy. I got one jumping on my neck, squeezing me really tight. I got the other around my waist and the other one who's barely walking, grabbing around my ankles. And they wouldn't let me go. Daddy's home. And they're all trying to compete over who's talking to me and telling me stories and what's happened. That's Mary in this passage. Jesus, Rabbi! And she's embracing him. She's holding on to him. She was healed by this man. Many people had demons cast out of them in the Gospels, but Jesus did the healing of Mary. I believe when that took place, she was embracing her. She had, he had his arm on her. He was touching her. Now she's clinging to him. Rabbi, teacher. The first person that Jesus reveals himself to is not an insider. It's not a religious leader. It's not one of his disciples. It's a woman who had seven demons in her. I don't know who you are. I don't know where you've come from. I don't know what you've done. I don't know what past you have. Jesus wants to show himself to you today. And Jesus wants to say your name today. He knows you. He knows your every detail of your life. He sees you. He knows your name. And he calls your name today. You might think you're here honoring your mom. You came to Easter service. I want you to know it is not an accident that you are here today. Because Jesus wants to reveal himself to you. He wants to say your name and say it's me. I, I'm alive. Listen, the, the angels told Mary, he's not here in this tomb because I want to tell you he's here in this room. He is here in this room. He's not in the tomb. He's here in this room. As a follower of Jesus, there's never a second that you will live the rest of your life that Jesus is not present in your life. Jesus is fully present in this room right now. He is working and he is, he is present. And he calls Mary's name, Mary and she recognizes him. She turned in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, hey, you, you got to let go of me. At some point, Mary, all right, you got to let go of me. It's good to see you too. And one day, we're going to meet Jesus face to face. One day, he, and Jesus is going to say to us, you're here. And we're going to say, you're here. You're going to have that encounter with Jesus one day. You're going to meet him face to face. Mary meets him face to face on this side. Jesus says, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things about her. I want to focus on the first thing that, that she says to Jesus what does she say? My, my Lord. My teacher, my Lord. So personal. Can you say that about Jesus? He's my Lord, not just our Lord. He's my person. It's so intimate here. Jesus, you're my Lord. Yeah, I know you're other people's lords too, but you're my Lord. There's an intimacy here. Because you changed my life, and I will follow you anywhere and everywhere. I will follow you. Even in my grief and in my pain and in my suffering, I'll still follow you. Some of us are in it right now. There is 
there is pain and there is suffering and, and Jesus shows up and we think he's the gardener. But here's the reality. He is the gardener. He's the capital G gardener. Because Jesus says, I will prune. I am in the business of pruning. Jesus is the gardener. But he is the gardener for every follower of Jesus. He is pruning things, meaning he's cutting off things of our life that he does not want present. And it's difficult, and it's hard, and it's painful, and it causes suffering. But he's doing it for our, for our good and for his glory. And if you're in that right now, I want to tell you that the gardener who's pruning, he has holes in his hands. And, and the, the carpenter who's working on, on all of us as followers of Jesus, those, those hands have been wounded, and those hands have been, have been scarred. C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity says, I suggest to you that it is because God loves us that he gives us the gift of suffering. Pain is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. You see, we are like blocks of stone out of which the sculptor carves the forms of men. The blows of his chittle, chisel, which hurt us so much, but those are what make us perfect. Jesus is, is chiseling Mary in, the, in her grief and in her weeping. He's doing, he's doing a work in her. I, when I was growing up, I, there's a little Baptist in me. We're not a Baptist church. There's a little Baptist in me. I grew up in a small Baptist church. And we used to sing this song. It, it went, Because He Lives. Because He Lives. You're like, whoa, it's dark enough outside already. You, please stop. Because he lives, here are the lyrics, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because the tomb is empty, because Jesus is alive, you can face tomorrow. But more than that, because he lives, you can face yesterday. We all have a yesterday. We all have, there's things that have happened in our life. I mean, Mary witnessed trauma there at the cross. There's things that happened in her life. Because he lives, she can face tomorrow. And because he lives, she can face yesterday. And because he lives you can face today. There is nothing that Jesus has asked any of us to go through that he has not himself gone through a million times more. There is no pain, there is no suffering that he is asking us to go through. Not go around, not go under or above, but to go through. And Jesus says, I will go through this with you. I will be here with you. I am with you wherever you go. I will walk through the pain. I know it hurts. I know it's difficult. Hang, hang in there. None of us have the life that we thought we were going to have if we were being honest. And I'm encouraging all of us, we just be present in the life that you have. I can look at a hundred things and say, I wish this, I wish that, or I can be grateful for the life that God has given me, the journey that he's given me, that he's placed me on, and he is leading you. Do not not do not compare your life to anybody else's life. Mary Magdalene, do not compare your life to anybody else's life. I'm doing a special, unique thing in your life, and the same is true for each one of us here today. Jesus said, I love you. I love you. I want to walk through this, through this with you. Mary Magdalene's the last at the cross, the first at the tomb. Let me encourage all of us today. You can trust Jesus with your tears. You can trust him with your heart. There's tears. I believe the ground there outside the tomb was wet with the tears. That, that wet ground is fertile ground for transformational life to take place. Mary becomes the very first evangelist, the first person post-resurrection to go tell that, that he is alive. And just like Jesus entered this world in not a way that we would have predicted, he's leaving the world in the same way. Same way. I'm going to choose the most unlikely person. I'm going to choose Mary. Yeah, she's that woman. She becomes the first preacher, the first evangelist, the first missionary. Hey, go, go tell those disciples. I thought they got it after three years, but you, can you go tell them what's going on here? You can trust him with your pain, and you can trust him with your life. Some of us, we can give testimony. We've trusted him with our life, and it's worth it. Some of us may be on the other side of it where we haven't given him our life. We've, we've had conversations about him. We know some things about him, but we haven't given him our life. And I want to say to you, you can trust him with your life. Mary shows up thinking that she's going to anoint Jesus, and Jesus says, no, I'm going to anoint you. 
with my presence. Some of us came today, we're going we're gonna to give Jesus worship and we're going to praise his name, which is a really good thing to do, and we've done that, and we're going to continue to do that. But Jesus says, oh, but I'm going to show up to give you more of me. As you walk into the room today, I want you to know that Jesus is here ready to give more of himself to you, more of his grace, more of his mercy, more of his unconditional love to you. Wherever you're at, whatever you're walking through, Jesus says, oh, I have more for you. He never runs out. Whatever you need, he is the answer. He can give that to you. He is alive today, my friends. And he can speak to you. He can call your name. He wants to change your life just like he changed Mary's life. No matter who you are or what you've done or what's been done to you, Jesus says, he calls your name today. He calls your name. Oh, Mary shows up to anoint Jesus, but Jesus came to anoint her with his presence. She came to see a stone, but standing before him, Standing before her is the living chief cornerstone by which the church is built upon. She came clinging to living memories of him, but now she is clinging to the living, breathing person of Jesus, to his body. She came weeping, but the man of sorrows, Jesus, turned the weeping into praise instantly. She was weeping in one second, and the next second she's worshiping him. I don't know what you're weeping about today, but Jesus changes everything. Jesus changes our tears into praise. Joy, when does joy come? Not in the darkness of night. Joy comes in the morning, and no matter how difficult and painful and dark it is in your life right now, there's a morning coming. Lamentations tells us his mercies are new every morning. Every morning, God will give you enough. He will give you more than enough. He will give you what you need to make it through that day, not for tomorrow, but for today. Jesus is enough. He is the answer. Some of us have been trying to figure this all out on our own. We've been trying to make this right. We've been trying to cast these demons out of our life by myself. These addictions or these struggles or these pains or these these hurts or this abuse that's happening. Whatever it is, Jesus is is enough for you today. She came, she came filled with anguish and grief, but here's the one who gives her a new headdress. She came in the darkness, but she meets the man who says, I am the light of the world. She came in the morning, but here is the morning dawn. I don't know what the wounds are in the room, the scars are, the thorns that you're dealing with, the difficult things in your life are, but God can meet you in the deepest part of that. The sin, the shame, the whatever you carried into this room, you do not need to leave with in this room because Jesus calls your name and he says, come to me. Very personal. This is not a family decision. This is not a church decision. This is a very personal decision between Jesus and you. He's calling your name. What are you going to do with him? You can trust him with your tears. You can trust him with your pain. You can trust him with your suffering. And my friends, I'm telling you, you can trust him with your life. Because he is risen. Death. What happened? Death did not have the final say. What happened there on the cross is the death of death. And what Jesus offers Mary is more than empathy. It's more than sympathy. He turns a tomb into a womb of hope. You know, the shortest passage in the Bible is Jesus wept. But it's the most pregnant Meaning, there is so much meaning there. That Jesus sits with you. He understands. No one in this room can say, oh, God doesn't understand what I'm going through. Jesus says, oh, let's talk. And he's calling your name today. Have you trusted Jesus with your life? He's defeated death. And I don't know who you've lost or what you've lost throughout the course of your life. In Jesus, through the resurrection of Jesus, it gives us hope that one day, as a follower of Jesus, you will see that person again. One day I will, I will see my mom again. I long for that day. I look forward to that day. Some of you have lost family members. And the hope of the resurrection tells us that this world is not our home. This is, this is fleeting and passing. It will be gone in a second compared to the scope of eternity. C.S. Lewis writes, Keep back nothing. Nothing that you have not given away will really be yours. 
Nothing in you that has not died will ever be raised from the dead. Look for yourself and you will find that in the long run, only hatred, loneliness, despair, rage, ruin, and decay. But look for Christ and you will find him. And with him, everything else thrown in. Look for Christ today. C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity. I'm just going to, I'm going to give two invitations. Uh, I'm going to ask for some courage and boldness. If, if there is a part of your life, if there is anything in your life that you need more of Jesus in, I'm just going to ask you to stand. If you need more of his love, would you stand? If you need more of his grace in your life, would you stand? If you need more of his mercy in your life, you need more of his presence in your life, you need more of his example in your life, would you just simply stand? Come to Jesus this morning. See him. Cling to him. Worship him. He will turn your weeping into praise. And if you've not given your life to him, if I'm going to invite you to trust Jesus with your life this morning. He can handle it. You can trust him. doesn't mean you will not have pain, grief, and suffering. But it means you will have the Son of God to walk through it with you. If you've never trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, recognizing that he paid the price for our sins, our sins have separated us from God. And some of us feel like today we feel alone, we feel abandoned, we feel ashamed. You fill in the blank, whatever you feel today, you've been trying to deal with that on your own. Today you can raise your, you just simply raise your hand and say, I want to see Jesus in my life. I want to give my life to Jesus. Would you just simply raise your hand? First time ever giving your life to Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Simply raise your hand and say, I want Jesus today. I trust him with my life. I believe that he defeated death and rose from the dead. Just simply raise your hand. Let me pray. And Father, hear our prayer this morning. We're all saying we need more of you. And some of us in the room are saying for the very first time, I'm giving my life to you. I trust you with my life, Jesus. Thank you that you will never leave us, you will never forsake us, that you are here in this room and you are working. I'm grateful for your presence. And Father, for those that raise their hand, we celebrate that. We celebrate the fact of new life, that they will live for eternity with you. God, as we sing this morning, I pray that the saints around the throne of heaven would hear our prayer, would hear our cry, would hear our worship, because Jesus is worth worshiping this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to take a moment to say thank you for joining us for today's service online. I'm going to invite you to our website where there are a number of different action steps to take following today's service. Maybe joining a small group or finding a place to serve, sending a prayer request into the church to let us know how we can help you and how we can be praying for you. If you found this message today encouraging and supportive, I'm going to ask you to like or share or comment and let us know and, and share that with your friends. If it's been an encouragement to you, I trust you'll be an encouragement to others as you share this resource. Hey, we've been praying for you. We're going to continue to pray for you throughout this week and trust you'll join us again next weekend. Have a great week.